Hector is a parallel supercomputer. It is capable of doing some 800 million million calculations per second, which if you struggle with these large numbers, an easier way to think of it may be to say that it's 100,000 calculations per second for every man, woman and child on the planet. Hector stands for the high-end computing terascale resource. It consists of about 30 cabinets, each of them the size of a large wardrobe, that contain the computer. And we have another 10 cabinets or thereabout for the disks and the tapes. So it's very big. It's got a petabyte of disk space. That's a thousand million, 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 million bytes. If you had this much on your iPod, started listening today, you'd finish in the year 3153. We wanted to see if we could portray what Hector does. Given that we had all of these wardrobe-like cabinets, we held a competition. It was won by a girl called Lily Johnson from Heaviset Old School in Norwich, and it shows you different types of research that we do on Hector. 95% of the knowledge that, that we have about the world around us comes from two different techniques. We have theory or it comes from experiment. There are, however, a whole class of problems where the situation is so complex that even if you know the equations, you can't solve them in a meaningful fashion. The climate is an obvious example of this. So what we do with a, a computer is we take those equations that we know to do what the scientist with the pencil cannot. We solve the, the climate or the weather for a little bit of Edinburgh, a little bit of London, and you stitch them all together to produce a picture of the, the entire globe. There are some 50 different research groups from around the UK that are using the facility, from biology and drug design at one end, through engineering, chemistry, and all the way to the environment. We've recently finished a project in understanding how dinosaurs walk. What two chaps from Manchester did was to discover that although hadrosaurs actually could hop faster than they could run, safety considerations probably meant that the, the two-legged running gait, similar to the one that we have today, uh, was a more likely form of locomotion. Turbulence is something that bumps you up and down. We also understand that in aircraft it's something that creates a lot of noise pollution. So we want to understand turbulence to minimise the discomfort to passengers and also to reduce aircraft pollution. But on the other hand, in the chemical industry, turbulence is used to mix compounds. So there's been a lot of work in, in many different scientific fields on areas such as turbulence and, and, and turbulent mixing. My area of research is in molecular simulation. So we run simulations on large computers that allows us to understand the structures of molecules, but more than that, to understand the dynamics of molecules as well. This piece of equipment I'm sitting beside just now is an electron diffraction machine. What it allows us to do is to take photographs, if you like, of molecules using a beam of electrons. Understanding the data that we get off of this machine is really quite complicated, so we rely heavily on the use of simulation to be able to guide us to understanding exactly what the data is trying to tell us. This is a model, a very basic model, of a pore of a cell. So if you look down the length of this model, these represent alpha helices. Um, and down the middle of that you see we've got a pore and all sorts of things pass through these pores in your cells every second of every day. So things like chlorine ions, sodium ions, potassium ions and hydrogen ions. Now hydrogen ions are so small we're never ever ever going to be able to see them experimentally. And so the idea is we can use simulation to be able to model how these hydrogen ions pass in and out of your cells. Why is that important? Well, it's how your cells maintain pH neutrality, why you, your cells don't get too acidic or too basic. And it's also the mechanism that your cells are able to generate energy, energy to make you think, to make you grow, to be able to fight disease and so on. 
Quantum mechanics is a very, very computationally intensive way to model matter, but it was the only way we could get to the answers we needed in this problem. So phase three Hector will allow us to be able to expand on our model. We want to adapt it, we want to modify it to make it even more realistic. Work that's only possible having access to very high computational resources. We're just about to move on to phase three of Hector, which is going to be roughly 10 times the performance of Hector when it started in 2008. This opens up a whole series of, of new problems that we can start to, to deal with. We want to look at a whole range of new so-called emergent phenomena. These are uh, phenomena that you wouldn't have predicted just from the appearance of the equations themselves. And we believe that these emergent phenomena will appear in chemistry, in engineering, and in, in biology as well. There are these challenges for which Hector is uh, a stepping stone that are the grand challenges for the, the next century we've just entered.